السلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نؤمن به و نتوقع علیہ من نغض اللہ من شور انفسنا مسیحت احمالنا من یحد اللہ فلا مدلہ لفمن یلہ فلا حدی اللہ نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وشهد أن محمد نبده رسوله أما بعد to my beloved Dr. Yunus and brothers and sisters I greet you السلام عليكم I want to say to um, brother um, Yasin that um, I have brothers and sisters really a lot to talk to you about this afternoon and I'm telling brother Yassine please brother I'm not going to stop you have to stop me <laughs> no I'm really honestly I mean I want you to stop me because in other words I'm going to go every second that I can go you just say imam pull just pull me back and say it's enough Brothers and sisters, I believe that too often we major in minor issues. And we minor in major issues. We major in minor issues, and we minor in major issues. I want to talk about today, which I believe to be the major issue. It's going to come back to this issue over and over again. And unless we address it, we will never succeed. Muawiyah was right when he said, La hakima illa dhul tajriba. That there is no real wisdom without experience. This word dhul tajriba has a dual meaning, it means. Experience means exper experimentation. You will notice scientists become who they are by their ability to experiment. And they uncover, they learn about Allah's wisdom through experimenting. Two observations that I've made. One, an observation of fact that America appears to be a very fertile ground for Islam and the growth of Islam. Proof of it? Everyone agrees that Islam is growing at a tremendous pace in this country. Now, between six and nine million Muslims in America. And the predictions are awesome in the years to come if we continue at the same pace or trend. America is so fertile that a brother like myself, no one in my family Muslim, all my life in public school, and I become Muslim. How is it possible that Abdullah Hakim Quick becomes Muslim? In America, Bilal Phillips become Muslim in America. Hamza Yusuf become Muslim in America. Siraj Wahaj becomes Muslim in America. Why is it that all of these people are coming into Islam and perhaps some of our best followers are still in the dunya? Why? Because America appears to be a very fertile ground. For some reason, people 
are coming, becoming Muslims all over America and all over even the Western world because it is very fertile ground. On the other hand, America is like a landmine where we have Muslim casualties. We have, on the one hand, people becoming Muslim, and on the other hand, we have a back door by which Muslims are going out of the back door and losing their deen in America. So at the same time, America is fertile for Islamic growth, and at the same time, it can rob you of your deen. So Muslim leadership must be aware of this and ask themselves the question, how do we maximize the fertile ground of America and minimize that back door by which people leave the deen? I was given the topic raising Muslim family in America. I've come to a conclusion. You may agree or disagree. But I've come to the conclusion, Dr. Yunus, that it is impossible for individuals to raise families by themselves. I have seen Muslim parents crying that their daughters and their sons are losing their faith, left the deen of Islam. Why? Because no matter how good a Muslim you are as an individual, you cannot save your family, you cannot raise your family by yourself. America is perhaps the greatest nation on earth in their institutions. So America is replete with institutions. I'm going to focus on this talk on two critical issues. One is leadership, and the other is, in the least way, the coordination of leadership, and in the best way, the centralization of leadership. Because I am of the opinion that all of these conferences will mean nothing unless we get to the point of centralized leadership. It will be talk after talk after talk, but nothing will happen, believe me, until you deal with the issue. And there is only one issue, and that is centralized leadership. You can't get, you can't get by it. You can debate the issue all you want. And I'll debate anybody who wants to debate me. I'm telling you, I stand here, whoever, whoever you are, if you show me you're going to be successful in America without centralized leadership. I want you to show me. And I'm letting you know that I'm not speaking for ICNA, I'm not speaking for the Islamic Circle of North America, I'm not speaking for ISNA, Islamic uh, Society of North America, I'm not speaking for Imam Jamil al -Amin. I'm not speaking for Imam Walatha Muhammad. Muhammad. I'm speaking myself. Brother Siraj Wahaj, I have an, an observation that I've made. I'm a father. I have nine children, and I want to see my children raised up as Muslim. And I, and I realize that I can't do it by myself. It's impossible. It's impossible. And either you know that it's impossible, and you don't want the people to unite, or you haven't come to the realization that that's the only way to save our family by the Muslim ummah coming together. Islam is a very concrete, very practical religion. It's not nebulous. It's real, it's concrete. Allah has blessed us as human beings with instruments of measurement. 
so we can measure things. So you get on the scale and you find out how heavy you are, how light, did you gain weight, did you lose weight? So a scale is an instrument to measure the weight of things. A thermometer is an instrument to, to measure the heat. How, how hot is it? How cold is it? You can measure it. A speedometer is an instrument that measures the, the speed of the car. How fast are we going? How slow are we going? An odometer is an instrument to measure the distance. How far have we come? What distance have we traveled? These are real instruments to measure things. But when it comes time to measure the most crucial thing among Muslims, and that is unity, the topic of unity is so vague that we can't measure it so that if we achieve that we don't even know about it. Try to follow me, brothers and sisters. So the angel Jibreel salat wa salam, said to Muhammad salat wa salam, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni an al-Islam. Oh Muhammad, tell me what Islam is. Islam is nothing, it's not vague. Al-Islam, and tashad an la ilaha illallah wa ana Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Islam is to bear witness. Open up your mouth, say it. There's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. But tuqimu salat is something real. It's tangible. You can see it, man. You got to pray. It's a real movement. You go to the master, you turn to the Qibla, and you pray, you bow, you speak, and you recite, recite the Quran. It's something real. It's not nebulous. It's not vague. You can touch it. What is it? It's fasting in the month of Ramadan. What is it? It's fasting in the month of Ramadan, making a pilgrimage to Mecca, what is it? It's given zakat. It's real, you can touch it, it's tangible. And so is the issue of unity. It's tangible, it's real, you can touch it, but we make it vague. You don't know what unity is. But there's one implication of the unity that we continue to miss. Conference after conference after conference. Yeah, when Muslims, well, Muslims all unite. What tossing will be hubbily led to me? I will have to thought Hold on all together by the rope of Allah. Be not divided. Yes, this is the Quran. But how to do it? Because I'm saying to you, in my opinion at least, you can't save that family. I don't care how tough you are as an individual. The only way you can save it is as an institution because it takes institutions to fight against institutions and you are asking us as an individual to fight against an institution impossible it's impossible you can't do it the only way you can defeat an institution is with another institution you know something say what you want to say about America a lot of people break their neck, literally, to get here. Risk getting on boats, travel across oceans to get here. People lie to get here. What is it about America? United States of America. United. United. United States of America. I'm asking you a few questions to see if you know about the President of the United States of America. If you know the answer, shout it out. What is the salary of the President of the United States of America? How much does he make a year? $200,000 a year salary. $100,000 a year expenses, $50,000 additional dollars traveling expenses, $19,000 entertainment expenses, and he probably spent all of that. <laughs> Where does he get all that money from? Where? Where? You pay for a salary. Who pays for the salary of the Congress of the United States of America? Who pays for it? Who pays the salary of the Supreme Court of the United States of America? 
Who pay for the army, the navy, the marines of American armies? Who pays the salary of the governors of America? Who pay the salaries of the mayors of America? Who pay for the salary of 30,000 police in New York City? Who pay for all the police forces? Who pay for the prisons? Who pay for the museums? Who pay for the school education institutions? We pay for all of it. We pay for the museums. We pay for the libraries. We pay for the hospitals. These are institutions. And you study your history, you find that America didn't become successful until those 13 original states agreed to become federated under centralized leadership. And then when they did it, then they became successful. And they had to fight those original colonies because they wanted independence. Each one of them wanted their own thing. We want, we want to be our own state. We don't want the interference of the federal government. But cooler minds prever, pre, uh, preserved, prevailed. And they elected the first president. President George Washington became the president. Now he becomes the leader of this United States and the rest is history. They become a great nation. Everybody's religion is not the same. One of the great things about America, we have freedom of religion. You, you can be a Muslim, you can be a Christian, you can be a Jew, you can be a Hindu, you can be a Buddhist, you can even be an atheist in this country. You can practice your religion. Go on and practice your religion. We're not going to stop you. So unity don't even mean having the same religion. America's united, they have different religions, different value systems. But they're united because they have centralized leadership. Did you know that American people spend $500 billion a year on public education? 8% of the gross national product. One of the leading institutions around the world in education, United States of America. Why? Because its citizens are forced to pay taxes. Now, you all know it, it, uh, IRS, right? Everybody know IRS. Now, what if you say, listen, man, I, I ain't going to pay no taxes. Not me. I ain't paying no taxes. What's going to happen to you? Throw your butt right in jail. <laughs> Why are you protesting? Huh? Now, brother and sister, now let me get to my point. I'm going to reverse it, bring it home. And again, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to talk as long as they let me. Now, if, if, you, if you let them stop me, then I'm going to stop. <laughs> now, I'm, just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm, the, I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it in 10 minutes, I'm telling you. I'm going to go as fast as I can, as much as I can, and when they stop me, I'm going to stop. I'm going to, I'm going to submit, and I'm going to sit down in my seat, and I'm going to open up my mouth. I love the messenger of Allah, Muhammad, والسلام, and his great Sahaba. I love them. These followers of his made us realize how great this deen is. And thanks be to them, they, they were the vanguards. And they established this for us. I want to call your attention to one, I think one of the, the pivotal, pivotal times in our history, and that is the death of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. I want you to go in your mind, I try to, try to put your mind back then. Here it is, that great messenger, alayhi salat wasalam, just died. Just died. And immediately we have a problem. First problem was Umar. You know Umar. Take out a sword, he's not dead. Now, <laughs> I mean, I may have been tempted to say, well, you're right, Umar, he's not dead. Got the sword in his hand, talking about the prophet's not dead. I said, you okay, Omar? Okay, you're right. You know how tough Omar was. But here comes a man 
the best friend of the Messenger of Allah, uh, Prof, uh, Bro, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the one that the Prophet said on his deathbed to Aisha to tell him to leave the Salat, and she said no because when he leaves the Salat and reads the Quran, he cries and the people can't, can't hear him. The, the one who cries when he reads the Quran, the, the real tender hearted one, real soft one, that's Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr comes and says, Allah! Can a Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qada maata? Wa man ya'budullah inna Allah hayyun la yamut. He comes and says that whoever worship Muhammad know that Muhammad is dead. But whoever worship Allah, Allah lives and he never dies. Abu Bakr. Told Big Bad Omar, sit down. Abu Bakr, tender hearted Abu Bakr, move out the way. And then now, the people gathered together, the Ansar and the Muhajireen. Even before the Messenger of Allah is buried, here comes the great, the great test. Qalu, they said, Minna Amirun wa minkum Amirun among us an Amir and among you an Amir. That's the test now. There it is. That's the test now. And this is the problem right now. Among you and a man, 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 we don't need any of it. We want one Amir. And because Abu Bakr stood up and Umar stood up, we had one leader. Abu Bakr emerged as the first Khalifa. The first test was passed. When will we learn that lesson? Number two, test. Some people, ah, the Messenger of Allah is dead. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no more zakat. Here come the tender one again. Wallahi, here's Abu Bakr. Wallahi. I swear by Allah, I will fight anyone who makes a distinction between Salat and Zakat. You pay that Zakat. And he went to war because some people refused to pay Zakat. Now you say, well, why, why he do that? Because most people don't understand what Zakat is. Zakat, I heard some Muslim, your Zakat be charity. Oh, shut up. <laughs> zakat ain't no... Zakat ain't no charity. You gotta pay it, man. Mandatory. Give it up. You know something? Uncle Sam say, yeah, um, yeah, Abdullah. How much you make a year? Ma, I make two, I make uh, seventy-five thousand dollars a year, and you put you fill out the form. Your Imam say, how much you make a year? None of your business. <laughs> Why none of your business? Because your real Amir is here, the Imam, the leader, the Amir. You give him no respect. In my conclusion, look at Allah, tells us in Quran, in the Masarakatu lil Fukarai wa Masakina, wal Amilina Aleha, wal Amilina Aleha. The Zakat, Allah give us the categories of giving Zakat, one of them is that you gotta pay the one who's responsible to collect it. Zakat is an institution. And now brothers and sisters, let me try in five minutes to summarize about another hour presentation. I'll try my best. Brothers and sisters, we need desperately to have imams and leaders that are free to work for us 100% of the time. Most communities, the imam goes to his job and then at night, he comes and gives an hour to the masjid. You can't have part-time workers and expect full-time results. Our leaders must be free. If Ikna really want to grow, you must tell the leader, 
the next four years, next 10 years, whatever it is, you don't, you don't work. You don't work outside of this. No, we, we pay your salary. And, and, and don't be saying, well, you ma'am, oh, this is sort of, you know, you, 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 we give you, we give you uh, $10,000. No. No, uh-uh. You better, man, Dr. Eunice, you can live off $10,000 a year? I, I don't think so. So we say, ma'am, we're going to give you what you need, take care of you, take care of your family. But what we want you to do, we want you to put your whole mind, focus on us. Focus on this Uma, focus on this Jamaa, focus on this so we can grow because we will never grow until you free your leaders. Free your leaders to take care of you and not have them give the best of their, of their life, the best of their mind on other jobs. Their minds is, is on where they, where they get paid. And so we give a little bit according to what we can to the community when it's over. So brothers and sisters, uh, New York City, we have 17 full-time Muslim schools. It's a small number compared to what we need. We need in the immediate future at least 100 full-time Muslim schools. There are 150 masjids in New York City. We want in the immediate future at least 1,000 masjids in New York City. Institutions. But I want to see in the city of New York, and I want to see in the city of Atlanta, Georgia, and I want to see in North Carolina, and I want to see in Washington, D.C., I want to see a big library with 10,000 volumes of Islamic books so we can do research. I want to see an Islamic museum. We can do it under one condition. We agree that we want to bring our leadership together and choose an Amer for America one. And whoever it is, don't make, don't make me a difference. It can be, he can be from Nigeria or Sudan and his skin can be as black as charcoal, or he can be from Bosnia, his skin is white, don't make me a difference. He can be an Indian, he can be an Arab or non-Arab, don't make me a difference as long as he's gonna guide us according to the Quran and the Sunnah. Can you, can you say, can you say, can you say the same thing? Can you say the same thing? That doesn't matter what color your leader is. If you're Muslim, doesn't matter what color he is. Obey the Amir. Whoever's appointed as the Amir above you or, or, or among you, obey him even if he's an Abyssinian slave with a head like a raisin. Did you get it? Did you get what the prophet was saying, man? Did you get it? Did you really get it? So, I'm telling you, Imam, I'm going, he's, he's standing, that, I know what that means. No, I know, see, I know body language, I understand. I, I know, I, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming almost. I, I gotta hold him in one hand, hold him back while I finish. I'm saying, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, pri publicly what I'm gonna do, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's on the tape. And Dr. Eunice, I'm saying this, and I wanted to go out, I'm serious. I will go across this country if Allah please me, and I will make every person here dissatisfied until we get one Amir. I'm telling you now what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna shake it up everywhere. And when everybody go to your leader and say, a leader, we want one Amir. What do you think about that? Put pressure on him. Put pressure on our leaders. Say, we want one Amir because we can't survive as an Ummah until we get one Amir centralized leadership. We have to work toward it. We have to plan toward it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salamu ala ibadi alladhi nastafa. Amma ba'd fa'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا 
وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون صدق الله العظيم Dear respectable brothers and sisters, respectable Imam Siraj Wahaj and all the leaders of the Islamic movement. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessing who guided us to be here today just to please him alone, to learn from each other about his deen so we can practice it in a better way in our lives. The subject I'm going to share with you is the rahmah and compassion in the family. That is the main theme of this convention. In the light of the seerah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was and continues to be the rahmatullil alameen the mercy for all because his living model which he has left with us it continues to guide us in the path of rahma the love the compassion and the mercy we must continue to learn about that and more than that practice in our lives so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran the ayah recited before you from Surah al rum verse number 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He created for you from your self, from your race, from your nature, the human beings, your spouses. So that you can seek tranquility and peace with your mutual relationship. And he has put between you mawadda wa rahmah, love and kindness and mercy, compassion. This is the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in this family relationship, he has given us the compassion, the caring and the love and the commitment and dedication for the lifetime. It is his sign, it is the mercy and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this, there are signs for all those who do think, who take lessons out of this. And when we look at the example of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as in all other matters in Al-Islam, in the deen, we find the practical example of this rahmah and mercy and kindness. In one hadith, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي The people amongst you who are good to their families, their spouses, they are the one who are best amongst you. And I am the one who is best to his, in his conduct and character to his family, in his compassion and mercy to his family, so therefore I am better amongst you. And then he also said, خِيَارُكُمْ خِيَارُكُمْ لِنِسَائِهِمْ Best amongst you are those who are best in their dealings, in their attitude, in their behavior, in their love and compassion to their spouses. And we are told, عَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ In your dealings at home, in the family life, you should do it in the best, in the most beautiful way with the liberal use and practice of love and compassion. And if there is something, some deficiency, which you may look down upon, then look upon all the khair, the goodness which Allah has given. And the Quran tells us, فَإِن كَرِهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْءٌ وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرٍ كَثِيرًا You may dislike something, some defect, some deficiency, in your spouse. And you may not like it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a lot more goodness in there. 
So therefore look at the beauty of the goodness which is there and try to minimize if there is something which you may not like. And when Hadith Prophet ﷺ told us that the example of your wife or the women you marry is just like this, that they are created out of the ribs and if you try to straighten it up, that means you use harshness, roughness, you may break it. The relationship will be gone. But if you leave it as it is, this is also not good. So use your hikmah, your wisdom, your love and compassion if you find some deficiency to correct it. Rather than using the other ways which may lead to the breakage of relationship. And the righteous Muslim as your wife is the best blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. He's told khayru muta'ad dunya al mar'atu saliha. The best blessing of Allah in this life if you have a wife, if you have a spouse who is saliha, who is righteous, this is more than any other blessing one can ever have in this life. And now let us go a little bit to the house of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and see how he dealt with his spouses and the compassion and mercy that he had in his home life. We just see a glimpse of that going to the seerah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we find out that a husband who is loving, who is caring and who has deep compassion for his spouses. Somebody asked Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers, that how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa deals with his wives. And she responded, he is with them like other husbands are, but he is most kareem, most kind and very, very compassionate and merciful and also loving in his attitude to his wife. He cared for all his wives, but also we know that he had special love for Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, umul mamineen. And there are many examples in the seerah we find out that how much he cared for her, how much he loved her. One time she was suffering with some headache and Prophet ﷺ was so worried about it. And he said, it's just, just like, it's, it's, I have the headache, I am suffering the pain. Prophet Muhammad was expressing his love and compassion, caring for his wife, even when they were having any kind of ailment or suffering, he would feel the pain, he would share their suffering with them and express his, 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 his kindness and make dua for them and be with them. Aisha also had great love for the Prophet Muhammad At night, sometimes she would wake up and would not find him. And then she would start looking for him. And in those days, they didn't have the light at night. And she would keep looking for him. And many times she would find that he's in salat. He's doing his tahajjud. And then she'd be very much satisfied, feel that he's close by, he's not away from there. And then she'd go back to, to bed. One time he, she didn't find him and he was not at home at night. And she gets out of the house and starts looking for him and she found him in the, in the graveyard, in the cemetery where he had gone and was making dua for those who are in the graves. And she looked at him and she was satisfied, came back to the house and went back to her, her sleep. So she would feel all the time about him due to the love and the compassion which is there. So when there is a compassion and love on the part of the husband, we find in response Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives more love in the heart of the, of the spouse. And so therefore there is far more caring for each other, 
far more compassion for each other. Similarly, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, as we all know, she was much younger age, and at one time, she would play with the dolls, and her friends, her friends would come in, and they would start playing with those dolls. One time, Prophet ﷺ, he saw the dolls there, playing dolls in the, in the house, and he asked her, Oh, Aisha radiallahu what is this? She said, these are my dolls, and I play with them. And there was one which was in the form of a horse with wings. And he said, I didn't know that the horses had wings. <laughs> she said, well, I learned. Sulaiman salam horses used to have wings. <laughs> this was the response, and he said, yes, maybe you're right. And he, he laughed and smiled just like we are left. One time, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she arranged for the marriage of a, of a girl, you know, she raised. And the marriage ceremony was going on, and Prophet ﷺ came and said, where are the singing girls? You know, there should be some kind of a entertainment here. There's a marriage going on. It's not, a, it's not that serious at this moment. So he participated into the marriage ceremony, and there were some little girls who did sing at that moment. Similarly, at the time of Eid, there were some people who came and were showing the wrestling match and playing around. And Aisha asked that I would like to see that. And he just stood up on the door and let Aisha stand behind him and watch the, the wrestling match and all of the games which were going on at the time of Eid. And one time she had, was arguing with the Prophet on, the, on some matter. And Abu Bakr comes to the house, and when he saw that Aisha is speaking to the Prophet and in, a, in an argumentative way, he got very upset and he came to, to almost hit her because she was his daughter. And Prophet told him, well, just leave her alone, she'll be all right, don't worry about it. And then he just left. So he smiled and told her, see how I save your neck. You were going to beat enough right now. <laughs> but I came at the right moment to save your neck. She said, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Similarly, sometime he would be in a light mood in the home and tell her the stories. There was a famous storyteller in Arabia. His name was Khurafa. And he had written many stories, and people used to quote their stories. And he would tell her some of the stories from Khurafa. And one time he told her the story, it is reported in the Hadith books, of 11 women. They were friends to each other. And one time they got together, and they said, well, let us all tell us about your husbands. How are their husbands, how they treat you, and so on. It's an interesting story and very long hadith you find in the books of hadith. But one of the women, her name was Umm Zara, and she praised her husband. She said, my husband is the best one I have. You know, he treats me so well. He's so compassionate, he's so loving. I have nothing to worry about. I got a nice, the best husband in the world one can ever think of. And she goes on and on, and we have all the details in, in the book of Hadith. And after he told her this story, he said, you know what? I'm just like Abu Zara for you, like her, that woman's husband was to her. I'm just like that to you. She's, and she, of course, nodded and agreed with that because that's the way Prophet ﷺ was to his, his wife. And whenever he used to make wudu and go for salat, he would show his, his love for his wife and kiss her and go for salat to the masjid. They used to eat together from the same plate. And as a matter of fact, she reports that sometimes she would eat a piece of a meat and he would take it from her and eat from the same place where she was eating from to show his love for his wife. 
Similarly, she would travel with him in different journeys, going to the Ghazawat and other places. Many times it has been reported that she would go with him. Of course, he would draw the lot and see whose names comes out of his wives. And then she would go, but many times she has also traveled with him in many journeys. And one time, Prophet ﷺ, he was in a journey. And the Sahaba were going and they were behind. And he was in a light mood and he said, Aisha, may Allah please with her, come let us race. See who is going to win. She said, yes, fine, let's just try that. So they were racing. And this time Aisha, ta'ala, she did not have that much weight and she was able to beat him in that race. Many years later, again one time, he was in that light mood and asked her, let us try to race again. And this time she gained some weight. <laughs> she was not able to run that fast. So Prophet ﷺ was ahead of her and beat her. She, he said, and he smiled. He said, this is the, this is the revenge for that time that you beat me. <laughs> now I beat you this time. She said, yeah, that's true too. <laughs> So all these instances we read from his life history to tell us that even though the Prophet of Allah, the teacher of the whole mankind, talking about the death and the akhara, very serious you know, mission he had, but in spite of that at home, he had light moments and he was always showing this compassion and love. And it was not always serious going, going on, don't talk to me, I'm busy, I have to go out and give lectures, I have to write the books. You know, why are you interfering with me? No such thing we see in his life history. Rather, we see that he is participating in, in the matters of entertainment and uh, leisure time activities and so on. It's all going on in his, in his home. One time, again, this is a very interesting thing. Aisha, anha, she had some headache. And Prophet ﷺ told her, well, I wish you get relief from it, but again, I wish if you die before me, before I died, I would have given you the bath and then buried you and done the funeral and made dua for you. So Aisha ta'ala said, well, you wish for my death. If it happens, you are going to bring another woman right into this hujra. <laughs> So she responded in a very, very light manner, and he smiled and he laughed. He said, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> but anyway. One time, you know, he was talking about Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, Ummul Mu'mineen. And he used to remember her a lot, because all what she had done, you know, was his wife a long time, supported him when he was in a lot of challenges and problems. So he was praising her, and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she got a little bit upset with the natural feeling of real jealousy which comes there between the wives. And she said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa you keep remembering an old lady of the Quraysh who had died for a long time ago, and you keep on praising her when Allah has given you better wives than that. So after that, Prophet ﷺ said, this wife of mine, she supported me when the people denied me. She helped me when the people rejected me. And when I needed support financially, she opened all her wealth to me to support my mission. And Allah gave me the children from her and so on. But this again tells you there was such kind of uh, exchange of conversation happened, which is quite natural and is seen in, in, in the atmosphere of compassion, understanding and caring. And one time Prophet ﷺ told Aisha that I know when you are happy with me and when you are angry with me. When you are pleased and happy with me, you say, Oh Rabbi Muhammad, Oh the Lord of Muhammad ﷺ. 
But when you are angry with me, you say, Oh, Rabbi Ibrahim alayhi salat. So you change the conversation, and I know that you must be angry and upset with me. But in the home atmosphere, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she would do everything to make the life of Prophet comfortable. She herself would prepare the food and do the cleaning, make his bed, wash his clothes. And similarly, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we must all listen to this and try to do that which we all lack. And there is, he used to participate in the household acts and, and the various functions. It has been reported that he used to mend his own shoes and would sew his clothes and would go out and get the milk from the goat. All these things, he would feel no hesitation to do that and to help his wives in the household matters. Then various instances happen in the life and seerah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, including the, the matter of if we all know how difficult time it was in the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the hypocrites, they accuse Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha with a false accusation. And this thing went on for many days. And finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his, his revelation and then cleared Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha of any wrongdoing. But during all this matter, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa could not say anything. He once, one time talked to her and asked her that if you have done something, you should do tawbah. But if you have not done anything, then Allah will testify to your good conduct and good character. And the ayat came. When the ayat came down, telling the highest conduct of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and telling that this accusation was false. Then her mother asked her, Oh my daughter, you should stand up and thank Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She said, Well, I will thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. He is the one who came to my help. He didn't help me. I was in a lot of trouble and a difficulty, but he could not. So I'm going to, to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it in light mood, you know, of course. And similarly, other matters which happened, we find that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was showing extreme kindness, love, compassion, not only to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, to other his wives. And this is the example and model I want to share with you this, in this short period of time. But then we must also understand that the family does not mean only husband and wife. There are children in that family. And we see in the seerah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he loved his children. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, he always tried to visit her, hugged her and kissed her, and whatever he could do to make her life comfortable, he would do that. When his son Ibrahim died, and he was told about it, he came out, and he picked up the dead body of the child, and he started crying. The tears were coming down from his eyes, and somebody said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, what is this? He said, this is the compassion. This is the, this is the love which Allah has given in the heart of the parents. And this is what I have. And, and, and he said things to say that I, I will miss you, my son. So he had great compassion and love for his children. One of his granddaughter, she used to come to the house of the masjid. And when he was doing salat, she would ride him on, on his back. And he would not say anything. When he go down to the sajda, she would sit on, on his back. And then he, he would hold her and then bring her down when he's trying to get up so she's not hurt. And he would love her so much. One time he got a little necklace and he said, I'm going to give it to the one I love the most. So everyone thought maybe he will give it to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala But he gave it to his granddaughter whose name was I think Umema, he gave it to her. He said, this is the, my granddaughter, I love her the most. And he gave, gave it to her. And then other children and other, his family members, extended family, which he had, his aunts, his uncles, even the, the, 
the lady Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha who took him when he was a little child in, his, in her house and breastfed him. Whenever she would visit him, he would stand up, put down a little cloth in the ground and invite her to sit down and, and do everything possible to show his love and respect and compassion to her. So this is the example that we see not only between the husband and wife of love and compassion but to the children and to the extended family. And this is what my brother and sister we need to follow in our lives. This is what brings the strength in the family and this is then what we're talking about in the, in the last session. The children feel the same love and respect for their parents. And to raise the children in the righteous path in accordance with the teaching of Islam, it becomes very easy when they believe that their parents are their best friends. Their parents are the, are the most well-wishing for them and they will be happy to listen to the guidance which is provided to them when there is love, forgiveness, compassion and mercy in home. Inshallah that family will be together and that family will enjoy the life here and also inshallah in the hereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us that he is going to gather such families in the Jannah. The family which is the family of Mu'mineen and Salihin and they have love and compassion in this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather them in the Jannah al Firdaus. And then he is so kind and merciful that if the father or the mother is a higher grade in the Jannah and the other member of the family is the lower grade in Jannah, he is going to raise their level up and gather them in the highest level in the Jannah. And brother, sister, my conclusion, I would say that this is the main ingredient which must exist in our family relationship as Muslims. And this is going to bring us together. This is going to make our lives most beautiful and full of happiness and pleasure if we follow the first step of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of uh, mutual respect, honor, love, compassion, forgiveness. And with this we move forward together in the path of Islam, helping each other to grow and move forward in excellence, in ihsan, in al-Islam, then inshallah I think, I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make successful here in the hereafter and inshallah we'll be together in the Jannah of Firdaus. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته